how are the entities known as Ignorance and Want presented in Charles Dickens' novella, A Christmas Carol? Let's find out. Yo, what's going on, Revision Squad? It's me, Liam, aka Mr. Knight, aka Dystopia Junkie, and in this video, we are going to think about the presentation of the entities known as Ignorance and Want in Stave 3 of Charles Dickens' novella, A Christmas Carol, which I promised I would get around to eventually. Although Ignorance and Want appear only in a very tiny portion of the story, it's actually super important to have a firm knowledge of them. They could be relevant to a number of likely exam questions you could face, including those to do with the themes of poverty, social inequality, or perhaps even the supernatural, whereas they will also enable you to make some very strong and perceptive comments about Dickens' views and intentions when he wrote the novel. As per usual, you're probably going to find it useful to grab a pen and some paper before we get properly started so that you can take notes of the things that I discuss over the course of this video. And if you do find this video to be really helpful, please do consider dropping it a like, commenting to let me know, subscribing to my channel if you aren't already, and sharing with your friends, classmates, and maybe even your teachers too. Speaking of subscribers, at the moment, less than 25% of you who watch my videos are actually subscribed, which is shocking. So why not help me out and press that nice red button? It really does make my day. Anyway, sorry about all that cringy YouTuber stuff. Let's talk about ignorance and want, yeah? I think it's important to have a firm grip of just who or what characters are before I analyse quotations that relate to them. So, in this case, just who are ignorance and want? So, thinking literally and viewing them as just characters, we could say that ignorance and want are two feral and sort of spectral children who are shown to Scrooge by the ghost of Christmas present. I say sort of spectral because Although they aren't spirits in the way that the Christmas ghosts are, they definitely aren't real children either. Thinking more deeply though, we could consider what their story role is. Now to consider this question, I often ask myself, what was the point of Dickens putting them into the story? And my answer to this is that they are designed to evoke an emotional response from both Scrooge and the readers by showing them the extent of social injustice in Victorian England. By showing these haggard and basically monstrous entities to Scrooge, Dickens is able to show the difficulties faced by the poor in Victorian England. Difficulties which the Cratchit family largely make do with, but that others would have fallen foul to. And as a symbol, metaphor or representation, so thinking more deeply still, I would say that ignorance and want represent aspects of social injustice, quite literally having little to no formal education or ignorance and never having enough and living a life of poverty or want and all of the associated evils of these two characteristics. If you wanted to get really fancy about it, you could perhaps say that ignorance and want are the evils of social injustice personified. Remember that Dickens was a champion of the poor and advocated for greater support for the least advantaged in society, and as such, he's likely to view the mechanisms by which the poor are kept poor as being particularly abhorrent. Anyway, if that's who I think ignorance and want are, which quotations could we use to analyse them? Okay, so I usually begin this section of the video by warning you that all the page references come from this book, it's backwards, this book, and that our page numbers are likely to be different. Now, that's still true, but I think it will be even less of a problem than usual in this video, because I'm focusing on a super tiny part of the story, the scene with ignorance and want at the end of stave three, and because I'm going to be covering it sequentially. 
meaning I'll be starting with the start, and you know what? Ending with the end. So, our first glimpse of ignorance and want is seen in some of Scrooge's dialogue, in which he says, somewhat startled, I see something strange and not belonging to yourself protruding from your skirts. Is it a foot or a claw? But what can we say about this? Well, I would argue that this initial glimpse of ignorance and want presents them as strange and bestial, a word meaning like a beast, and yes, it's supposed to not have an A in it. Now, strange is pretty obvious, because Scrooge literally says strange. But why not analyse the more complex foot or a claw? In being unable to discern whether their appendage is indeed a foot or a claw, ignorance and want are presented as being very, very unusual. Something not quite human. After Scrooge notices the foot or claw, the ghost of Christmas present properly presents ignorance and want to Scrooge. From the narration, we learn, From the foldings of its robe it brought two children, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. They knelt down at its feet and clung upon the outside of its garment. But what can we say about ignorance and want based on this quotation? Well, the list of negative adjectives in the first sentence suggests a number of things, but I've decided to settle upon the idea that they present ignorance and want as being pitiable, so as things worth feeling sorry for. The prominent position of miserable as the final adjective in this list is a key factor for me settling on this view, but I think it also makes sense given what we know about Dickens' political stance. He would have wanted his readers to feel sorry for the poor, not fear them or hate them. The second sentence in this quotation is also interesting. Not only does the fact that ignorance and want are kneeling at the spirit's feet and clutching at its robe further present them as being pitiable, but the fact that they are clinging to the ghost of Christmas presents robe, emphasis on the present, might also suggest that they are very much a problem in Scrooge's time. Ignorance and want are not seen as a historical issue, nor some far flung off future problem. They are something that is incredibly relevant to the time in which Dickens was writing, in which at least a quarter of the British population lived in immense poverty. The spirit then demands that Scrooge looks upon these entities, and when Scrooge does so, we are treated to the following incredibly detailed paragraph. They were a boy and girl, yellow, meagre, ragged, scowling, wolfish, but prostrate too in their humility. Where graceful youth should have filled their features out and touched them with its freshest tints, a stale and shriveled hand like that of age had pinched and twisted them and pulled them into shreds. Where angels might have sat enthroned, devils lurked and glared out menacingly. No change, no degradation, no perversion of humanity in any grade, through all the mysteries of wonderful creation, had monsters half so horrible and dread. Now, there's loads we can say about this paragraph, so do bear with. Firstly, the incredible amount of detail that we see throughout this paragraph but particularly in the list of adjectives, yellow, meagre, ragged, scowling, wolfish, and the long, multi-clausal, compound, complex sentences that are common in this section of text, emphasises just how downright ghastly and subhuman, or at the very least unchildlike, ignorance and want are. Clearly, they are not normal, healthy, happy children but are instead entities that have been completely warped by social injustice, poverty and deprivation. Even describing their skin as yellow implies that they are sick and malnourished. In the middle of this paragraph, we can find religious language. 
Now, in literature, it's not uncommon to see children compared to angels, given youth's connotations of purity and innocence. However, rather than being compared to angels, ignorance and want are compared to devils, and menacing devils at that. This could suggest, then, that ignorance and want represent modern evils. This doesn't mean that they themselves are actually evil, but that the things that have caused them to become so deformed and unusual are. Again, knowing Dickens's political opinions makes this idea seem more credible, because he saw poverty and its effects as being, well, just awful really. Having experienced both poverty and wealth, and having frequently seen the impact of the former in his adult life, as evidenced by his visits of Cornish mines and writings about ragged schools, Dickens poured his energies into writing these societal wrongs. The paragraph ends in a very hyperbolic way, as Dickens writes that nothing to have ever existed was anyway near as horrible and dread as ignorance and want. This emphatic ending reinforces the idea of ignorance and want being deformed by an immense unnatural evil, an evil caused by rampant social injustice. Immediately following that long descriptive paragraph, we get to see Scrooge's reaction to having seen ignorance and want. Dickens writes, Scrooge started back appalled. Having them shown to him in this way, he tried to say they were fine children, but the words choked themselves, rather than being parties to a lie of such enormous magnitude. Now, of course, if this video was about Scrooge, we could talk about his terror or how he attempts to show these children some compassion, which would help us to talk about his transformation. But the thing is, this is a video about ignorance and want. So what does this quotation reveal about them? Well, I would argue that it shows that ignorance and want are so hideous and profoundly disturbing and unnatural that even language is appalled by them, given that the words themselves decide to not be parties to a lie of such enormous size. You could even say that the phrase choked themselves demonstrates some very violent personification, because the words would rather kill themselves and die than complement ignorance and want, which is very extreme indeed. The Ghost of Christmas Present provides Scrooge, and by extension us as readers, with some more information about these entities. In its dialogue, the spirit states, This boy is ignorance, this girl is want. Beware them both, and all of their degree. But most of all beware this boy, for on his brow I see written, which is doom, unless the writing be erased. Now, if we're going to analyse this dialogue, I think an important place to start is at the names ignorance and want themselves. These two abstract nouns encapsulate many of the problems social inequality causes. You see, because of a lack of proper education, many of the impoverished would have been ignorant and therefore severely disadvantaged. Without a proper education, the poor would have been unable to gain new skills, or gain them easily at least, which would have been key to them obtaining social mobility and escaping the clutches of poverty. Similarly, want would have been one of the major problems caused by social inequality, and clearly indicates poverty. Want is experienced when one does not have something, which is pretty much the underlying condition of poverty. People living in poverty in Victorian England did not have enough money, enough food, sufficient housing, sufficient rights, and so on. Through their names, then, ignorance and want explicitly relate to the symptoms of social inequality. We could also choose to analyse the abstract noun doom. 
Now this is an incredibly hyperbolic word and used in this context it suggests that not correcting social inequality will have disastrous consequences. Now it isn't exactly clear to whom or what the spirit sees this doom having an impact on. For instance, if social inequalities are not corrected, then the boy, ignorance, will remain forever ignorant and will be unable to escape an impoverished life. Or perhaps the spirit is speaking more broadly. You see, if social inequalities are not corrected, then all of the poor people in A Christmas Carol will be forever destined to lead a life of poverty, and poverty will beget more poverty, which will beget more poverty, ad infinitum. But who says that this doom has to only extend to the poor? What if the spirit, and by extension Dickens, is trying to suggest that unless social inequality is righted, all of humanity is doomed. Doomed in the sense that humanity might crumble and perish, but perhaps also in the sense that many members of humanity will be consigned to an eternity in hell for not showing their less fortunate peers a greater amount of compassion. Now, that argument might be a reach too far, and you know what, it's perfectly okay for you to not buy into it. But what I think is important is that we take note that the word doom is certainly something that is analytically rich and worth discussing in our writing. Scrooge and the spirit converse some more. Scrooge asks if there is any refuge or resource for the poor, showing a bit of compassion, so well done Scrooge. But to this the spirit retorts, are there no prisons? said the spirit, turning on him for the last time with his own words. Are there no workhouses? Now, I think that this quotation, with ignorance and want in mind, is pretty straightforward. By using Scrooge's words against him, the spirit exemplifies how the poor were generally viewed and treated by the rich in Victorian England. And by using Scrooge's words to specifically refer to ignorance and want, their status as representatives of the poor is cemented. All right, so that's the quotation analysis complete, but don't close the video just yet though, as we've still got a summary to look at and a question or two to reflect on as well. Now, if we wanted to summarize the presentation of ignorance and want in the story, we could say that as symbols for social injustice, ignorance and want are presented as feral subhuman entities, which allows Dickens to convey the idea that social inequality is inhumane and wicked. Short and sweet, don't you think? So why not pause the video and copy it down into your revision notes? That way, you'll have a quick and easy summary to hand, one which also allows you to start to explore some of the story's key themes and Dickens' intentions as well. And for this video, I've actually got two possible questions for you to reflect on. Lucky you. So, why is it significant that Scrooge is introduced to ignorance and want at the end of stave three, rather than elsewhere in the story. Or if you want to do something else, why is it significant that ignorance and want are depicted as children rather than adults, the elderly or animals? Now these questions are designed to further your understanding of the figures of ignorance and want, as well as the writerly choices Dickens has made in his story. Not only should that help you to write about A Christmas Carol in a more detailed and perceptive way, which is guaranteed to get you better marks, but paying more attention to a writer's choices should also help you to produce more effective and compelling creative writing, which of course is another key component to your English GCSEs. If you want to pop an answer to either of these questions down in the comments section, please do feel free. It genuinely makes my day to see your amazing ideas. I think it would be wonderful to build a community of students who freely discuss their ideas about the GCSE set texts. And you know what? I'm usually pretty good at replying to the comments too. So if you did decide to share your ideas with the rest of the world, 
you'll get some feedback from me. And so that is my discussion of ignorance and want complete. I know they only feature very minimally in the story, in my version of the book, about three pages, but I hope I have proven to you in this video why they still might be considered important. Now, I really do hope that this video has helped you out in some way and that you found it useful, informative, or just plain interesting, especially if you are currently studying A Christmas Carol for your GCSEs. Anyway, as ever, I hope that you have an awesome rest of the day. If you are revising, please do remember to take frequent short breaks, as a burned out student is not a happy or successful student, which is what I think you deserve to be. So ignorance and want are depicted as subhuman monsters, and it has to make you wonder, is this Dickens' way of suggesting that poverty, poor education, and all of the evils of social inequality, well, is he suggesting that they are inhumane and monstrous as well?